with that being said, welcome. Uh, my name is Neil Silcox. I'm excited to be here to talk about early career research and teaching uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I am speaking to you now from Chibuktuk, uh, Halifax, and um, I want to acknowledge that I'm on unceded Mi'kmaq territory, but we have people joining us from all across the country. If you'd like to take a moment to drop uh, where you're calling in from into the chat, I would love to see it. And you know, there was just a really sort of stressful, difficult IPCC report about the impact of climate change. Um, and it's one of those things that's sort of hard to engage with because it, you can feel quite powerless. And it, it makes me think in this moment that I'll, that part of what we can do to honor the land, the stolen land that we're on, is do all we can, even if that feels like an insignificant amount, to care for that land. So we have people from Wolfville, Bayfield, Moncton, Trenton, uh, Michisagi, um, Charlottetown. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you so much uh, for doing what you can to make the world a better place. I'm really excited to have this conversation with two colleagues um, whom I've met relatively recently. Matthew, I've known for a couple of months. Matthew is the OLTC program coordinator for the uh, Maple League um, and is a PhD candidate in English at, uh, is it York University, Matthew? Is that correct? Great. Um, and just one of the best beards on Zoom uh, in my experience. Um, we also have uh, Jasmine Sidhu. Is, did I pronounce that correctly? Jasmine, I didn't ask. Okay, that was a nod that said close enough. So apologies for the little bit that I was probably off. Um, uh, Jasmine it teaches at Bishop's University and she and I met just a week ago and I've had just incredible conversations and I'm really excited. So I'm gonna share uh, my screen we have a little bit of a slide to help guide us through the day, and we'll talk through what the day is going to look like. So, early career research and teaching, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'm gonna invite my guests to uh, introduce yourselves a little bit and tell us about who you are, what you do, and, uh, and what you're interested in sharing today. Does mean, can we start with yourself? Yeah, hi. Thank you for having me here, um, Neil. I really appreciate being invited to talk. Uh, what I am is a professor. I teach in the psychology department at Bishop's University, and my principal concerns and aims have always been associated with pedagogy in STEM-related fields. Uh, I'm really excited to have a discussion because this one's a little bit more personal. It's a reflection on me and my career as it currently stands at the moment. So I'm excited to be a part of the be a part of this discussion with you. Uh, I'll pass it off to Matthew. Hi, thanks, Jasmine. Um, I'm Matthew Dunleavy, the program director of the OLTC program um, at the Maple League. So I've been over the past few months meeting everybody at Acadia, Bishop, St. FX, and Mount Allison. Um, like um, Neil said, I was a Shirk doctoral fellow and PhD candidate in English literature. Um, and I'm also the president of the board of directors for a nonprofit um, called Leader Learning Essentials for Adults in Durham Region, where I'm sort of still located. Um, and I'm only here because when Neil emailed me to say, hey, would you like to be part of the Better Together session about early career researchers? I said, that's a bad idea. Um, I don't know if I can say anything good, but he's managed to pull the good out a little bit over the past couple of weeks. Um, so that's why I'm still here. And I'll pass it to Neil. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, as I said, my name is Neil Silcox. I am the faculty excellence lead at um, the Maple League. I'm also, uh, for the last eight years, I've been teaching acting, directing, and theater making um, in universities and colleges across Ontario and now uh, in the Atlantic region. And I also have a company, the Canadian Theater Educators Conference, which is um, really interested in um, considering how we teach theater especially practical theater in the studio, because for a long, long time, it was done in a very dangerous way. 
And so I have a national, a national group of theater educators that I work with. Um, and the thing that we all have in common is that we are all in this, what we call early career. Um, so uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, click here to add text. That part you should ignore. Um, we're gonna, we're gonna try as much as possible not to spend too long on the bad and the ugly um, because, uh, because we, could, we could go on um, because it affects us very deeply and personally. We have a bunch of questions that we're gonna talk about and we're gonna limit ourselves to one minute answers about that. Um, and then we can talk about the good as well and hopefully uh, be aspirational and forward facing. Um, but first we wanna figure out what early career really means. Matthew, can I throw it to you? Yeah, so I got stuck on this early career idea when we first started talking about this session. Um, and what I want us to do is I want everybody, and I mean everybody to throw in one word in the chat that you think defines an early career researcher or an early career teacher. Hmm. So just one, one word. see what we can get <laughs> exhausted thanks to me. beginner beginner learning anxious anxious and exhausted are there together lost student yeah fresh fresh fresh, fresh and lost at the launch pad innovative that's nice progressive they're mm -hmm. nice positive words optimistic love all these overwhelmed Opportunity, risk, excited, introductory, low pay, perfect. I think there's, I think there'd be a whole research paper of like who chose what words and what part of their career they're at, <laughs> just in there alone. Um, that's a um, that is a eclectic, eclectic mix of words. Um, but I'm gonna actually give you the tri-council definition. So a lot of us are funded through the tri-council at different stages. And for the tri-council, um, they, and I quote, an early career researcher is a researcher with, within five years from the date of their first research-related appointment, minus eligible delays. And what they define as eligible delays is very limited too. Um, can I ask Neil to move to the next slide? The problem with that is it imagines we get stale. So there's this five-year window where, like some of the words that popped up, we're fresh, we're exciting, we're great. And then if you don't have a job after two or three years after your degree, like Neil's put on there, you're a skull face, I think is what he was trying to get at there. No, but your career is in some ways over. The, the idea of the early career researcher teacher was there was this clear trajectory that you did your studies you went into your first appointment and then you went into some kind of full-time appointment usually tenure track or, or whatnot but that's not a reality early career also seems to imagine that we're some freewheeling no strings attached 20 something so um, when we see nine months of po nine month of po uh, appointments in BC, we can take that. And then the next one, nine months in Nova Scotia, we can just jump on a plane and move our lives around. And that we just want to work, 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 work. I think Neil was prompting me to sing there. Um, that we're, we're, that's all we want to do, that we don't have lives. I have two small children and they're, they're obviously as much a part of my life as my research and my teaching. Um, but an early career researcher, the way we imagine that, doesn't account for those things. And finally, by capturing us early career researchers in this sort of small window that we'll move on from, also ignores all the people that face the same struggles, but have been contract teaching for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. They're not captured in the tri-council definition, but they're also not counted as the tenured colleagues that have these the job security and and that sort of acumen behind them so we had frame this discussion with that as a problem we know the framing is a problem we're just borrowing from um common parlance and I'll, I'll pass it off to neil thank you so much yeah and i think we've got 
uh, between yourself and myself and Jasmine, we, re we represent a few small slices of what is a big pie of what might fall under early career. So we want to acknowledge that limited perspective that we have. As we go into this conversation, here's how the conversation is going to work. We've each we've prepared six questions, two each, three of which I, I have put to define some of the problem. And that could less generously be uh, three opportunities to uh, complain and moan about it. Um, and then three questions which might help us to define a path forward or think about something we could do in order to come to a better way of managing uh, the early career um, teachers and researchers. In order to keep it limited, as I said, we're going to talk for just one minute each. I have a little timer. I'm going to, we'll give, we'll have infant forgiveness if we go a little bit over, but we could go on and on as we discovered in some of our earlier meetings uh, earlier this week and last week. And at the end, we were going to stop the recording and then we'll open up the conversation to the floor. And we'd love to hear whether you are senior faculty or uh, first year undergrad. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts and questions um, because it's really valuable to have input and understanding from wherever we come from. Which brings me, I think, to our first question. And um, Jasmine, this is your question. It's part of the bad and the ugly, so buckle up. Um, would you care to read it? And then, and then I'll start your timer so you can offer an answer perhaps to this question. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I'll read it for sure. What expectations did you have about academic life before embarking on postgraduate studies, which you wish you had been disabused of? All right, when you're ready. So I think the key um, issue I had was the lack of transparency about the job market. The job market for PhDs is extremely saturated. One individual professor is training approximately 20 to 30 students. And if we're not careful, you could even consider academia closely approaching or approximating a multi-level marketing or even pyramid scheme, where some individuals are putting some investments of their time and money and getting little return because they have a lack of job security and outcomes. So I wish I would have been a little bit more realistic. I wish I would have thought a little bit more about what happens and the scope of the environment at which I'm entering into, which is an extremely competitive and saturated job market. And I'm being really direct and honest with you because that's something I would have loved to tell myself a few years ago. Oh, look at that. Three seconds to spare. Well done. Uh, thank you. Uh, Matthew. Um, would you like to take a minute to offer your thoughts uh, about this question? Yes, go. All right, um, I would have just liked to know that tr success would translate into something. I don't know what that something is. Like Jasmine's touched on jobs, but just I wish I would have been clear that what what does success look like as a as as a PhD and a researcher and a teacher. Um, I've been very lucky and worked hard to get multiple awards to fund my studies. But then also, um, they didn't cover nappies in the early years when my partner was on maternity leave. But then the same breath had professors say, oh, well, you'll be able to go on vacation because you got a shirk. They're not the realities. Um, $20,000 reward doesn't pay the bills. You're still below minimum wage. So being successful doesn't actually give you security, comfort, and the things that you'd expect from doing well in a particular career. Three seconds to spur like just me. Nearly, nearly oh, got boy, four you're setting, you're setting me up for failure. I'm going to go long. I know it. Um, the thing that I thought about when oh, I, I started early, the thing that I thought about when I, uh, when, when this came to me was um, the fact that, especially as an early career um, researcher, you're often moving from institution to institution to institution. And while every institution has its own unique setup, I got no information about the way that institutions worked and, and what is a provost and what is Senate and, and you know, what is collegial governance and, 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 and that system. And so I kept showing up and I kept kind of getting in trouble or feeling I was putting my foot wrong. Um, and so in addition to not having been 
maybe having been sold a bill of goods about the uh, about the job market, I also felt that when I got on the job market, I wasn't prepared to have meaningful conversations about the scholarship of teaching and learning, about the way that a program works. I didn't understand that if, you know, how, if I have an issue with a program for the course that I'm teaching, like what are the, the tools in there? Oh, I went long. Okay, that's me. Um, thank you. Uh, Matthew, you authored our next question. And so I'll invite you to read it, share a little bit, and you tell me when you're ready to go. Here we go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so this is a very specific to right now, but how do we account for COVID-19 in our careers? Um, what does that look like? Because we're, um, everybody is in a, a different position through the last 18 months and continues to be. All right, so so, so start me off there, Neil. There you go. Um, I don't know the answer to this, but I think it needs a restructuring of, of, of how we value the CV. Um, so I had two chapters and an article ready for the last year during COVID, they were canceled. Multiple conferences were canceled. But also to put proposals in, I have to look forward. But I'm not in the position to put those proposals in now because the next year is still unsure. So we might look at COVID and people seem to think it's over and that's a whole other story as this like one year, 18 month gap in our CVs or some of our CVs. But we're looking at sometimes three or four years of gap, people that haven't been able to get into their labs, um, people that haven't been able to publish at the same speed of people who, who have been able to continue working through this trauma or upending of their lives. And we need a solution to reevaluate CVs now. Oh, you're so concise. This is incredible. Um, my thoughts, um, yeah, I think this is really tricky and particularly because we're, we're very aware, I think that COVID-19 was a different, what's that quotation that was all over social media? Like we're not all in the same boat, we're all in the same storm, but some of us have different boats, you know? Um, so someone with children at home had a very, very different experience, I think, than someone without, um, without those obligations, you know? And, um, we know that COVID hit communities of color much worse. Um, and it hit, you know, I work in the artistic community. So there's a real like um, gutting of the live theater community because of COVID. Um, and so um, I, I worry that some people will have done just fine. You know, some people, it might've really helped them to kind of clear the decks and they didn't have the responsibilities and they could really hunker down. And that those people who didn't have real world responsibilities or who didn't have maybe personal experience of COVID through a family member or personally, that they'll end up being extra steps ahead. And I didn't even get halfway through my thought, but that's it. They will, they'll, and it'll suck. Thank you, Jasmine. Okay, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> so I still grapple with this question when it was posited to me. I didn't really even really know how, what to say, to be honest. For me, COVID-19 was extremely uncomfortable because it was such a year of growth. I learned so many skills, how to do so many things, things I never thought about before, like CPU usage on my computer when delivering an online class. Uh, but the other thing I grapple with, and I think every single teacher that taught during COVID-19 grapples with, is the amount of unpaid work that was done. This amount of work that we did, and it's hard to say how much you deserve, but you just know you work maybe two or three times harder, deliver a quality education. And so that's something I have difficulty accounting for myself. So it for myself is still something I'm trying to resolve on how to account for it for my career. I developed professional skills, but I also did it at my own expense. Wonderful. Thank you. This also reminds me of something Matthew was talking about earlier, which is that his school uh, offered a whopping $100 in order to procure the technology needed to do online teaching. Um, Pause oh, there, Neil. We've lost you for I'm, a minute. We've lost me. Sorry, my internet connection is unstable. What a joy. Um, I was saying that it also reminds me of how Matthew was talking about how 
uh, an institution offered a hundred dollars per individual to get the, the technology needed for a year's worth of online teaching and, and research. All right. My question is this, in what ways does the limitations of being in early career limit your ability to help your students? Um, the thing that I'm most aware of is that, as I said, I, I travel from school to school to school and especially in COVID, I've become so aware of the precarity of mental well-being in students, you know, and, and how much that, that taking care, that the caretaking of students is the foundation on which all education happens and that you really can't be teaching students who are in crisis or who are, you know, struggling in that way. Um, and yet there are really poor trainings in place for me as I move from campus to campus to help me to know what to offer students. Usually I do a couple hours of training that are like workplace hazardous materials training. So I, I discover that I shouldn't be spraying bleach everywhere, but uh, which is fine, I wasn't likely to do that. But there's no talk about what are the resources? What are the phone numbers if a student comes to me in crisis? Um, where can I send students on campus to, to give them help if they're if they're struggling academically? Um, it just feels like I never quite know, and I have to do a lot of again unpaid labor to find those things on my own. I went over. I'm so sorry. Um, up next, Desmine, when you're ready. Okay, I'm good. Uh, so for me, the biggest limitation is I'm not able to create a research office for myself, a research orientation. So I cannot get students to start developing my own research profile. So I cannot uh, give students opportunities in research. So that's a, a heavy limit on my career ability. The second thing that I have difficulty with is developing the depth of my courses because I don't have feedback from the same population. So uh, data is extremely useful. Having taught a course two or three times to the same population in the same area, that helps improve, uh, really improve what you're doing. So at some ways, when you deliver a course and you keep on delivering fresh courses or new courses, you never have an opportunity to improve the quality of what you delivered. So uh, that limits me, the quality of delivery, as well as my building my own research profile and giving students research opportunities, because I'm not sure if I'm there. Terrific. Thank you so much. And to bring us home, Matthew, your thoughts. I think, um, oh, yeah, all right. Um, I think the hardest for me is when you get that question, um, can I take another class with you? <laughs> and you have to answer, I don't know. Um, that you want to build these long-term relationships where you can actually help students grow throughout their whole degrees. Um, or even where I've had multiple students that have benefited from deferring a class. And that then pushes their final exams or final essays into the next semester where I'm not teaching. So then either a stranger has to mark that work or I have to, again, do it for, for unpaid labor. And I want to do that to help them succeed. But how often can you do that? If, if it's one or two students, that's fine. But if it's every student and you're teaching at five different universities, that is unsustainable. So there's things that we have as solutions when we're teaching one or two classes, but the, that don't exist when you, when you build it out. Great. And I, I see Tony um, echoing your sentiments. Uh, Matthew and Jasmine in the comments. Thank you, Tony. So we're hoping that we can start to find some, uh, some critical hope, which is, which is I think really important. And I think that there is, uh, there are things that can be done to, uh, to move us in the right direction and little things count and moving in the right direction is important for hope. We're gonna go in the opposite order of asking the questions. Uh, so I am going to start, and my question is this, what can mid-career and senior faculty do to help their early career colleagues, other than pushing for institutional or systemic, that's, that's systemic, but over two lines, change? Um, so other than being an advocate for change, what can they do 
that is actually within their power right now. And I did rainbow uh, countdown because it just seemed more happy. Um, because of that, um, I, I've seen, I've had very great colleagues, you know, and, and the institutions have been on a range of great, of, of okay to kind of okay, you know, um, but the colleagues I've worked with have always been really terrific. And um, I think just being really cognizant of all the things that someone who's coming in new or who, who doesn't, who's been away for the summer, you know, and, and doesn't know the conversations to, to spend a little time helping to orient them, um, even if they've been there for several years, um, but to say, this is what's going on. This is the, this is what's happening in the program this year. These are the, the conversations you weren't a part of over the summer. Here's a new resource the universe has, the universe, the university has brought out and the universe. Um, but um, spending some time uh, with those uh, temporary faculty, early career faculty, um, maybe as a group, I think would be really, really valuable. Uh, it's something that I really appreciate when colleagues find the time for it. Okay, that's me. Up next, Jasmine. Okay, I'm good. Uh, I believe uh, the single most important thing that could be done in my opinion is publication partnerships. As an early career faculty and with limited term appointments, I cannot build a research profile. So I don't have a lab, I don't have students, and maybe I don't even have a grant and I have to reorient my research profile to fit the university that I'm at. So if you are a mid-career senior career faculty and you could bring uh, an LTA onto one of your projects where they could be co-lost -la author, not all of your projects, but just one of them, that helps immensely in their evaluations in the future. So publication partnerships, if there could even be a system in place at a departmental level, when you do have LTAs coming in, if there is a mentor available or a project that can be worked on together, having some foresight about that, I could think could help build the profile of that early career researcher. Wonderful. And could I just ask, just mean LTA, just because we have people for whom this might not be a new term, could you define that so it's a, Yeah, sorry, that's a limited term appointment. So that's when you get a contract to be uh, teaching for like a year. I'm an LTA at Bishop's University. I get a contract for 10 months. So I'm not really sure if in 10 months I'll be back. Right, thank you very much. Okay, Matthew, uh, any thoughts? All right, thank you. Um, I'm big big for pushing open educational resources and open access I, like i think push a creative commons pop, pop a creative commons license on something and throw it into the public but i think and the reason i you bring that up is i think faculty that uh mid-career senior faculty could be less precious with their resources and syllabus um because if if a if an early career colleague is getting a course august the 28th to start september the 4th it would be invaluable for them for for them to have a syllabus should or uh, an assignment handout or some kind of resource like that that doesn't mean that they have to reinvent the wheel every time they're creating a new course and by sharing those resources we're only making education better and i know there's there's this want to hold on to it but it's not stealing it's just for helping students that that, that that's what the main aim should be Oh, there we go. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Matthew. And I think we're going to go straight back to you, Matthew, to read this um, this question of yours. All right. So my question is, is there a way we can realign the value of the work we do? And just to add context before I hit play or Neil hits play is what I'm talking about here is why does say a publication and two conference papers in the last year on your CV look better than teaching a five, five course load as a contract faculty member, or why is that more valued for academic jobs than the work that say Neil and I do in sort of academic adjacent support work where we're actively improving teaching on campuses but we're not doing the same work that 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 has this particular value. All right. Just before I hit play, can you 
I actually ran into this as a, you know, part of the university system that I didn't understand because I wasn't taught it in my graduate studies. What do you mean when you say a five, five, Matthew? I'm five courses for like a double five and five, five, one, five and fall, five and winter, lots of Great. teaching, teaching, teaching. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Here we go. Um, so um, Hannah McGregor at SFU is doing some wonderful work on this right now, which is I'm um, trying to set up a system in place for um, valuing podcasts. How do we create peer-reviewed podcasting and have that sort of public intellectual work count towards tenure and promotion or just the jobs in general? But it will re require us rewiring our brains too, that publication in the top journal isn't necessarily any less work or any necessarily any more work or more valuable than having a podcast where you're you're reaching out to millions of listeners versus being downloaded by five academics in your field that just want to make sure what you're doing and fit you in their research um and and i think we need a full overhaul of what of what that means and i think it's happening we just all have to be behind it great um jasmine when you're ready yeah i'm good i'm good so for me, this was a two-prong two answer. Uh, the first is that the values and morals of the university, what they choose to value should align with their evaluation metrics of the position that they're hiring. If they are truly involved in providing the most uh, you know, advanced type of undergraduate education they can, then their evaluation criteria should reflect teaching metrics. So there has to be some sort of uh, reflection of value onto evaluation criteria for positions. And I actually see uh, that we need to start involving the modern age of the pedagogical world. And uh, honestly, it touches on what you were saying, Matthew, a little bit, in that science has failed dramatically at giving real facts to the public. And reach is important, and how we do that is important. And we should start reevaluating how professors are going about that so we could start to make larger impacts being felt across the public domains. I'm sorry if I ran out of time. That could be expanded a bit more, but there we go. That's great. It leaves you wanting more. Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Um, for myself, I was quite surprised as I as I got deeper and deeper into into university systems, from from popping in once to teach a to teach a class and leaving to to getting a fellowship and getting a little more involved, to in understanding that um, how much thinking about the student experience is really not at the heart of universities. You know, like that publication is so important and grant funding is so important, and, and for many many people, the students are just they're kind of also there. You know, oh, I, I also do teaching and. Um, so I think that everything, I think there's real value absolutely in research. And I think the value in research should be understood in how well it helps you to bring the next generation forward. So I think that I would love a university where everything is evaluated in relation to teaching, whether that's research, whether that's, um, you know, scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, and, and that the value of what you do in class and the reviews you get back from students and your thoughts about those reviews are valued, uh, are valued more than I think they are. Okay, that's my minute. Thank you. And our last question uh, is from Jasmine. You want to take it away, Jasmine? Uh, sure. So this is more of a global answer. I think you have to start my time. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, do you want to read the question? Oh, sorry. Yeah. What kind of educational reforms might be necessary in graduate schools today? Great. Here you go. Thank you. Sorry. Um, this was a really important question for me because we keep on inviting people into academia, but academia is a very saturated job market right now. It's a it's a very demanding type of job, and uh, it can also be a toxic environment for people of certain communities. 
So what kind of educational reforms might be necessary for graduate schools was something I actually do think about. And I think we are moving towards some type of evaluation. For example, when you have someone who plays the stock market, if they're an investor, you look at how good their investments turned out, and then you evaluate them to decide if they're good. Right now, universities don't have any type of evaluation metric. Across North America, you can spend up to $200,000 to get a degree without a guarantee that you will actually make that money back and live debt free. So at some point, we have to have, start having a system that evaluates the outcomes of university to really quantify the value of a degree. And this, should, this is an answerable question and we should be trying to answer it as academics and to make our university systems better. Uh, and that's it. I went over time. I love that. <laughs> that's fine. It was so good. Uh, thank you very much, Yasmin. Um, Matthew. All right. Um, I think we just, I think we need to readjust program requirements. Um, when I read all the books, all of them, all the books in the world for my comprehensive examinations, um, and then sat down and wrote essays over two days and then had an oral exam and was questioned on the rhyme and scheme of one particular Victorian poem. That has not adequately prepared me for anything. And there's many instances of that where there's this holdover, like I can Google the rhyme scheme of, of, of Hardy's poems. Um, there's, there's this idea that we, we've kept the programs the same because that's the way we do things. But if that's not preparing you for jobs that don't exist anymore, they have to be reevaluated of what is worth people's time. Why did I spend two years reading all of that? I, I like reading, don't get me wrong, just for those two exams so I can move to the next stage of something that doesn't have continuous stages anymore. Super. Oh, yeah. Comprehensives. What a joy. Um, uh, my big thought kind of touches back on teaching, you know, and, and the priority that I think that universities need to spend on teaching. And I did, I did a program um, with a, where teaching was in the title of the, of the degree that I got, you know, uh, and I got very little. So I did that program for a couple of years and I taught a bunch of classes there. And then I've been teaching for eight years now, um, all kinds of classes all over the place. And I've never had someone uh, watch me do it uh, and and give me direct feedback. I've gotten feedback from my students who are in the room, but um, I never had someone just sit in for a whole class. Every now and then in my uh, in school, in my uh, MFA, a teacher would pop in and watch a little bit. But I think that we need to be understanding that if we are setting people up to be teaching in universities, we need to teach them how to teach. Um, and that really needs to be a priority because so often, we're just thrown in and expected that if you have the knowledge, then you'll know how to transmit it. And especially in theater, we ended up, I, I ended up teaching the way I was taught. And the way that I was taught was actually in theater, quite abusive. Um, so uh, this way to unpick that, I've gone over time. The way to unpick that is to teach people how to teach. Thank you. <laughs>